so uh, just to introduce the yeah, thank you. <laughs> to introduce the topic, uh, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to remind everyone some concepts because we're going to talk about food sovereignty, but we are not always clear about what it is about. So I wanted to remind you the definition that was given by the peasants organization Via Campesina, which defines the food sovereignty as yeah, the fact uh, from um, pe the people who produce, who distribute and who eat the food to, be, to control the systems uh, for producing food and distributing food. So it's really a question of governance, about people and citizens being on, on like controlling the production uh, facilities and processes, which today is not really the case because the agro-industry has a, a big uh, influence on the food system. So uh, to introduce yourself quickly, what I wanted to ask you is to tell us how this concept of food sovereignty resonates with what you are doing in your daily occupation. So, I don't know, Enrico, you want to start or...? Okay, hi everybody. So, uh, yeah, uh, I'm Enrico Stano, I'm a uh, member of uh, Germinal, it's one of the oldest uh, buying group uh, food co-op in Barcelona. And uh, yeah, uh, food sovereignty. Uh, I think that um, what happens in uh, Catalonia is uh, th something that is uh, really related with that and uh, resonates a lot with what Malik said because it's, uh, uh, there, there are like uh, 150 um, uh, food cops, buying groups uh, that sustain at community level, those are uh, community projects. Uh, that sustain the rural life uh, and producers, local producers. Um, so uh, I think there are two um, axes on, on this, and one is uh, the governance model, uh, is that uh, we must uh, follow a community-driven uh, uh, kind of economy, uh, and for food is something really basic for us. And the other one is the technological one, because uh, we think that uh, there is uh, a need of uh, uh, scaling this kind of model and uh, to intervene on, this, uh, on the food system on cities. And uh, I think there is a lot to say on technological sovereignty too. Thank you. Do you want to go ahead, uh, Emma, maybe? Or? Okay, thank you. Firstly, I just want to say what a fantastic presentation. So I really think there's a lot that we can inspire to do there, and uh, I will certainly be taking some of that back to the UK, so thank you. Um, my job at uh, Carlisle is very much um, the role of a partnership manager, and I work with strategic stakeholders. So it could be the chief inspector of the police, director of public health, leader of the council or the politician, and try to embed uh, agendas. And one of the areas that we've been working on is the food agenda. And I know that we'll be picking up in terms of how some of the governance and that works later. Um, I think the, the definition that you showed was really, really important in terms of food sovereignty. But I'd also like to go that step further and really highlight that the food um, should be culturally available and also health needs to be a key part in that as well. Um, so within Carla, we are one of the founding member cities. There were 13 of a, um, a network called Sustainable Food Cities. And um, recently, that network has now expanded to 50 cities. And that's only been over a couple of years, um, who are working to do just what food sovereignty is about, to kind of raise the visibility, raise awareness, uh, develop um, uh, projects, uh, and also influence policy and strategy to make sure that it's embedded. Thank you. Mark, do you want to...? Uh, my, my story about the food uh, is a uh, long story, and uh, I'm interested about, uh, around the food, uh, LC, LC food, since uh, 15 years. I, I am a gardener since uh, more than 20 years, and um, when I stopped uh, my activities around uh, the, the building construction, uh, wood, wood building and construction, I, uh, I was uh, in a position where I, I understand that uh, food 
will be more important for the future for me. Because I, I was in an intermediate situation, and I think that if I solve the food aspect of my future, it will be more easy for the next step. And uh, because I'm, uh, let me say, I'm touched a lot of uh, labor during my experience, by experience, electronics, gardening, and so on. I developed a solution for me first. Uh, because I have a little space, I make it vertical. And uh, because it's running so well in the second step, I think that it can be a solution for the cities where the space is so small, the access to the space is not so easy. And uh, I think that as I, had, I have done in, for me, I think that a lot of people need to make, to grow their own food, to be uh, in line with the healthy food, because it's not so easy to access at the healthy, healthy food. But also, uh, we understand if we can, uh, if we analyze uh, the connection between food and petrol, if we, can, if we understand the problem with the food and the water, uh, I think that it's really important to begin to have a, a safety a solution for food where it's consumed it's in the cities. So you touch another point, which is the food security and resilience question about like being able to ensure that whatever happens, you can access a minimum of food. Malik, do you want to add like how this term of yes. food sovereignty resonates? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So even though our organization is called the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, what we're really working for is food sovereignty. And so I have to contextualize the work and say that as the ancestors of people who were enslaved in the United States and who still exist very much as a domestic colony, uh, one of the things an oppressive system does is it suggests to us that we don't have agency over our own lives. And so all of our projects are designed to inspire within our communities a sense of agency, a sense of responsibility for our own lives. And so we're struggling not just for food sovereignty, but we're struggling for sovereignty in general. So everything that we're doing is inspired to give people a sense of this res taking responsibility for our own lives and taking back our power and our humanity from the forces that have taken it from us. That's almost kind of a cultural shift that you are working on, isn't it? Yeah, it's for sure. It's a, it's a shift in our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And consciousness is, of course, the basis for culture. Our, our, our thinking shapes our culture. So we're really creating concrete models that will help people to see a new reality and perhaps even what we call a post-capitalist reality so that we can begin to think outside of the logic of capitalism. Thank you. So, Enrico, uh, one like big influ one big uh, position or posture about this question of food sovereignty is for citizens to like do things themselves like if they are not happy with the way the food system is organized with like those big supermarkets that are like centralized and and with like a very um, yeah vertical uh, and and very few people owning the the system so you as a community activist uh, think that uh, you need to do things yourself if no other, no other people do things absolutely. to change the system. So can you tell me yeah. like, why you started these buying groups and so on? Well, the, uh, absolutely that. I think that, um, uh, again, really similar to what Marika was saying, is that uh, we need to shift our uh, uh, way of thinking uh, things. Um, community projects are... Uh, uh, really, a really powerful tool uh, because uh, when uh, citizens, for instance, the, the example of uh, Barcelona. Barcelona, I, I said that uh, there are uh, 150 uh, consumers groups, uh, buying groups uh, uh, in the whole Catalonia. Uh, hundreds of them uh, are in Barcelona. Wow, be why? Because the city uh, doesn't have access to uh, fresh food has uh, the the outside, not the outline. Um, so people, uh, and this is really, uh, um, I think that is really strong in in Catalonia. Uh, people join together, and in their neighborhood, they uh, just uh, create those uh, groups, uh, community projects, and uh, uh, contact a producer, a local producer, and then just start uh, uh, sustaining that kind of uh, uh, bond. 
Uh, so uh, it's, um, it's a hard work, of course, uh, but uh, it's a sustainable one because uh, there is no um, extractive interest, for instance. Uh, so it's just the people themselves. I've seen uh, lots of uh, new producers coming from the buying groups. So uh, people join a buying group after one year, two years, uh, understand uh, there is a lot of demand in the city for food and I don't like to live uh, in the city anymore and I don't like my job. So um, they start training uh, to go outside the city and start uh, um, having gardens and, uh, and they become the provider of their old buying group, for instance. This is something that an external tool, uh, even a, a public uh, um, uh, government uh, cannot enforce. It's something that must grow from the community. And what is the impact? Because in your buying group you are like 30 or 40 people, so what small initiatives like that uh, really change in the food system? Yeah, uh, those kind of projects, yeah, it's like uh, 30, 40 uh, uh, people that join in one group. Uh, can be smaller or uh, even bigger. We have, uh, that's just an average. Uh, we have even bigger. The impact can be uh, really strong. And, and we have uh, uh, experiences in other uh, cities uh, of Spain. For instance, in Valencia, there is a one uh, buying group that ended up opening two shops in the streets because their, uh, people wanted, didn't want to go to, uh, to access the uh, ecological, uh, organic uh, food or local food. They don't want to go to the supermarket or to uh, some chain, you know. Uh, they wanted to the, the real deal, just to want to support directly the people. So uh, this can have uh, and already has a real huge impact on the communities and on the economy. It's, uh, so it's more like a pollination model, like a lot of yeah. small initiatives connecting together and yeah, yeah, yeah. having a greater impact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and it's, it works really like in pollination. So you join a buying group in one place, then you have to move to other, another part of the city. There is no buying group there and you found it. And, and that's something that we need, for instance, to, uh, to improve, to make it easier to create a new group. So you work more on distribution. So in your group, like you are taking back some control on the perimeter of this distribution to decide over the food you eat and you bring to food. Now, yeah. now I would like to switch to, to another dimension of it, which is the food production. Like, it is uh, like if you want to decide about the food you eat, maybe the best way to do that is to grow your own food. So why is it important for people to get back to growing? And uh, like, yeah, Mark. Uh, uh, it's not so easy first because. Uh, it's uh, working with a uh, living uh, green. It's live, and um, I think that uh, since a long time we are completely disconnected with uh, the nature and the complexity of uh, growing in good condition, good food. And um, I think that uh, we need to have a, a system where we can do you some you you proper experiences and grow by the community experience because it's uh, through the, the experience of the other, the improvement of the system, that everybody can grow uh, his uh, own food. Um, today, uh, in the rural area, it's e more easy because we have some ground, some, how do you <laughs> yes, but uh, in the city it's more complex because we don't have access to uh, space for growing and it's for this that I, we have developed a, a vertical solution where in one, meter, uh, one square meter we can uh, grow around 100 kilograms of food and uh, it's a, a, a way, the verticalization of uh, the growing, it's a way for growing uh, 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 our food on the city uh, area. But why does it make sense to produce food in city? I mean, you have a lot of space in the countryside around the city, and like there are a lot of farmers also who st who strive 
who try to make a living and it's very hard for them in the rural areas. So aren't we killing also the small peasants no, in no, the no, countryside? No, I, I think that both uh, are running in the same in parallel. Where are we are big cities, not so easy to have access to the, 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 the ground because uh, uh, we have a big competition with um, building and uh, sometimes each time. Every time it's a building with, uh, with uh, will win. And uh, I think that for small city where we have a lot of space around the city with good quality, uh, it's possible to make uh, biological uh, growing around the city. But in big uh, town like uh, Paris or like other, sometimes also some uh, big town with old industrial past with uh, salts which completely polluted by uh, metals and so on. It's not so easy. And I think that in the future, both systems will run. And um, we have a lot of uh, things, advantage in the city. We have all the roof. Uh, the roof is the access to the sun. The sun is uh, the photosynthesis uh, key of the growing. And uh, it's really uh, a real opportunity to um, reintroduce agriculture in parallel where we can outside the, 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 the city. But we have a lot of opportunity to recreate a green space uh, in the city and uh, create a local, really local uh, food, create new jobs because uh, it's a really an opportunity also uh, for, for a lot of people and create the choice of uh, foods rich in nutrients without pesticides close to the consumer. I think that if you live in a building, you can grow and uh, build, uh, grow your, your food on the roof directly. Mm. And I think that for me, it's my vision. Okay. Malik, you wanted to react? Yes, I just wanted to add a little bit to what Mark said and say that 100 years ago, most people on the planet lived in rural areas. Today, most people on planet Earth live in metropolitan areas. And so it makes sense uh, ecologically to grow food closer to where we have population density. One of the main causes of climate change is the industrial style of farming and the transportation of food hundreds and hundreds of miles. So in the United States, food is transported an average of 1,500 miles from where it's produced to where it's consumed. So that's contributing a tremendous amount of carbon into the atmosphere. But the other thing is that if people are eating food that's been transported 2,000 miles, the food is not as nutrient dense as if they are consuming food which was grown five miles from their house. Emma, you wanted to react first. Yeah, yeah. I, I completely agree with your points. And I think that um, when we are transporting food such a long way, it does lose all of those really rich nutrients, which are so beneficial for some of those populations that we're trying to reach. I also think it's worthwhile considering that we're seeing society changing. And what's really interesting in all of your projects is that you are trying to, as you mentioned before, change this food culture. I think today people are leading, or many people are leading such busy lives that they want something that's close by and easy accessible and something that they can engage with that's literally on their doorstep. So I think there is definitely, definitely power in that. And again, the majority of the cities, most of the populations, as you said, are based city-centrically. So it does make a lot of sense. Yeah, I have a question for you, actually, Emma. Because So we have seen some community initiatives and, and entrepreneurs trying to bring solutions. But what is the role of the city council in, in this uh, like food sovereignty issue? Yeah, so it's an interesting one. I almost say that whilst I'm based in the city council, I sometimes take my city council hat off to enable some of these spaces to take place and some of these community initiatives. And um, what we have um, done within the city is try to engage as many different partners and stakeholders as possible. And um, from that, we create almost a, a network of people who can influence and shape and change the way that things are done and add their voice to how they feel that things should take place within their city. So I guess part of the role of the city is a number of things. And we're, we're seeing some of the power, particularly in the UK, um, being transferred back to cities. Now, that could be in trying to shape policy and using your knowledge and your skills to say, 
come on, there's food missing in that policy. We need to make sure that's embedded in there. Or equally, it could just be um, championing things. It could be trying to facilitate or enable peppercorn rents. So I know you mentioned um, when we had a little chat earlier that the costs of developing projects and sometimes the land space is so, um, so costly that it stumbles and makes the projects very difficult to get off the ground. So I think there's a real uh, role in kind of educating and getting people on board to um, enable these projects to happen. So you see the city council, as, as you say, as an enabler and a facilitator to kind of empower communities and entrepreneurs to, to propose new solutions and new ways of, of organizing that food system. But there is also another side of it, like there are a lot of um, like big industries that have a huge voice and have a huge influence today, also at the city level. So how do you prevent this kind of big established company to have this strong influence? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And actually, within my role, I've seen some changes take place. So one of the key um, pieces of work that we've been working on is something called the local plan. And the local plan is a planning policy framework. And for our city, it looks at, over the next 15 years, um, how our city is going to grow in terms of size, in terms of schools that might be needed, in terms of infrastructure. Now, unless we hadn't started our kind of network of people who were passionate about food and people who wanted to embrace it, we would never have been able to utilize their voices to make sure that food featured in that policy. So that's one thing to say, right, tick, we have that in our policy. Some time ago, I remember all those individuals saying, okay, well, we've done that, which is great, what do we do now? And I say, now it's over to you. You have got the hook there to start to shape or challenge things that are taking place. So, for example, it might be challenging some of those supermarkets to say, actually, I, I don't think this is the right way. You know, you featured within some of your local plan documentation policies and strategies that this is really, really key. Um, but it, within the UK, um, particularly in my area, we've actually seen the, um, the larger chains, the likes of the Tesco's, de-investing in our city. They've seen a completely different change in people's culture and people's mindsets. And um, we were planned, and I don't know whether it's a link with the policy itself and the framework that we've developed, or whether it is something generically, a new movement that seems to be happening around this, that they're saying, no, no, we're, we're not going to invest in this because people aren't buying from us in the same way that they used to. We have uh, in the room, uh, I think, Daniel Watley. Yeah, you're here from the International Urban Food Network. I, I would like to give you um, a mic, just if you have one or two questions for our speakers. So, yeah, yeah you can come here. <laughs> Hello, thank you. I have four questions, but it's the same one. Um, so, we, we, we had a, a nice storytelling here with those four people, nice people, but I'm still greedy, you know? Um, and I would like to clarify the concept of uh, food sovereignty linked with uh, you are building the new economy or the shifting economy, I like that word. And uh, we will make the, the, the link with the, the kind of governance you, you organize in your own ecosystem. I hear a lot of answers when I hear especially Malik, but I will ask again, so I will give you the opportunity to, to give more details. And my main question is, what is the DNA of the next economy, the next way to govern this society and your um, own ecosystem? I have four ways to, to ask this. What is really in your toolbox to implement new governance in new economy? How really you do? Give me some examples, please. The second one is, how do you practice Smart inclusion of your partners, colleagues, stakeholders, citizens, those who have a vote but no voice, but they have hands, brains, and so and so. And the third question, how do you disconnect people of organization from old patterns, acting like a, a tropism, the old, old, our old patterns in our society? So how are you really, in a tangible way, changing the culture of decision-making in your own organization, not in the society. Okay? Is that enough? Three questions like this? 
Make a choice, please. <laughs> yes, it's really around the governance. So can you give, uh, as Daniel asked, some more detail about really how the decisions are made, who really participate in those food policy councils, how are your organization like, driven, and, and how the decisions are made, finally? So maybe I'll start and uh, say that I'll talk about three different formations, the Detroit Food Policy Council, the Detroit People's Food Co-op, and the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. So on the, Detroit, on the Detroit Food Policy Council, when we created it, we wanted to make sure that the grassroots community had a strong voice in it. Many food policy councils in the United States and perhaps in other parts of the world are appointed by the mayor or appointed by other elected officials, and they tend to be very top-heavy with either academics, and I'm not totally anti-academic. I think academics have a role to play perhaps in the struggle. That's a joke. And <laughs> Uh, but they tend to be top-heavy with academics, so sometimes with people representing the industrial food system. And so we structured the Detroit Food Policy Council to make six seats representative of the grassroots community. And so our Food Policy Council has been looked at as a model of grassroots inclusion. So that's one of the ways that we try to kind of build this people's community-level democracy. In terms of the Detroit People's Food Co-op, all co-ops are, true co-ops are democratic models where you have one ownership share and you have one vote. So unlike a corporation where if you have lots and lots of money, you can buy 500 shares and have 500 times the votes of another person, within a co-op, there's no big I's and little U's. Everyone has one vote. And so we're creating this democratic structure and acclimating people to functioning in a democratic fashion. Within our organization, the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, Similarly, we have a very democratic process. We have lots of committees that decide, for example, on our farm, we have what's called a farm operations committee that meets every Friday. In fact, I'll miss the meeting tomorrow morning because I'm here. And that committee decides, it looks at the big game plan, but then it decides for the next week exactly how that work will be done. And so what we're really doing is training people to to giving people the experiences and how to function within a democratic structure because we're really not used to that. Emma, I want to add a, a small question like to, to a Daniel uh, question. Um, like especially on the, the role of those uh, big industries and like I'm really curious to see like in, in how you have shaped those food policy council in, in Carlisle, what is really the voice that they, they have? Um, so just going back to the question earlier, um, um, a point that you made, food is a basic human need. So it's something that we can all relate to. It's something that's important to all of us. And therefore, each and every one of you that's sat in this room, you're obviously here because you've got an interest in food. You are the people that can change it. You are the people that can help to shape that governance and shape things as they move forward. And I think you should never lose sight of that. That's really important. Um, when we started our journey, and I'm going to give you two um, elements here. When we started our journey, we started with a group of the willing. A group of the willing who were interested, who had a passion and had an um, ambition and had this mindset that they knew there was something better and they knew there was something that they wanted to change. And actually, they thought that they could be part of this movement. And from that, it's kind of these hearts and minds. You can see that they're there and they're bracing it and they want to take this forwards. So we pulled together and we held, and this is coming back to some of the tools, um, a big engagement event. And we try to invite as many different partners and stakeholders there. And it's really important to consider the narrative and the framing of who you're trying to get to engage at this point. So, for example, um, when we speak to public health, we talk about diet-related ill health. When we're speaking to people, um, economic directors or economy, we talk about how if we can help support the farmers, we can help support the local producers, we can help support the local city's economy. So we sell it in different ways for different people. From that event, um, we then look to develop um, a charter. And our charter was around um, core themes and core values, which had come out of the discussion from all of those people who were interested in food. So it tended to be around economy, kind of community, um, access to be able to grow, um, health and well-being, um, as some of, some of the examples. 
And from that, we started to develop an action plan, and our action plan featured our projects. So out of that came our steering group, and our steering group were people who were interested, and we had a chair and a vice chair. So that chair represented the collective views of those, those individuals. And my role is to make sure that where there's any opportunities to shape policy, strategy, anything, that chair's voice uh, is heard. If I take us back a couple of years ago, this didn't exist. And actually, we are now um, one of... We started off as one of 13 founding cities across the UK. The network now has 50. And we had our uh, annual um, event uh, taking place just a couple of weeks ago. And for the first time, what was really interesting is that what was a network of sharing information and sharing how projects work and helping each other to facilitate things all of a sudden felt like a movement. And that movement was like, okay, we're 50 cities now and we're saying the same thing. And actually that gives us a much stronger voice in terms of that higher governance level that at a city level we struggle to engage with. So coming back to the supermarkets, they say, oh no, we don't want to talk to you because nationally you need to talk to them and we don't want to come to your meeting because it's a national thing and we can't change it anyway. But 50 cities collectively having that passion around food and changing the agenda has to stand up and listen. And we are seeing a period of change within the UK, but I'm going to pass on that. <laughs> now just maybe before you, you answer Enrico, so you have... But like both this bottom-up and, and top-down yeah. approach, like it's really interesting like, to see, like I, I would have thought that the big, the local big actors would have taken a strong voice in those local policy councils, but it's not the case actually. They are more like stepping out and, and saying that it's not like it's their national policy and, and you don't have anything to say in their policy. Yeah. Is it... I think there's a case of they say this is, our, this is our policy and these are the key things that we need to develop and implement. But actually, in order for that policy to be effectively signed off, it has to be critiqued. It has to have public community representation in it for challenge. And I don't think sometimes communities and individuals and peoples realize, realize the influence they can potentially have. I think there's also something to say that politics is really key in all of this. And uh, it's really important to build relationships. Um, I'll come back to later some of your points around how to build some of those partnerships and things. Um, but that's really, really key. And everybody has a role in the system. Yeah, yeah we'll come back to that later. Okay. Um, so, uh, two aspects about governance. Uh, one is uh, that, uh, for sure, uh, all the food co-ops, buying groups, uh, we are talking about uh, in our area are governed with a democratic uh, uh, entity um, association cooperative uh, uh, with one person one vote and um, that one thing uh, the other thing uh, is that uh, at uh, governance level uh, traditionally we have a strong opinion about uh, staying as much as possible as mm, far uh, away <laughs> from the uh, local governance because uh, historically we had uh, lots of problems. And that means that uh, the majority of the groups, uh, for instance, uh, for the um, space that y they use, uh, they could go to the local governance and, uh, government and, and uh, ask for a place, maybe. But... Uh, we don't do that. We prefer to share the, the you know, the, the right um, and pay for it. Uh, this is uh, what we have been doing. Um, I must say that uh, uh, the actual uh, Barcelona government uh, has opened it a bit uh, and shed some light uh, in this uh, sector, the, the economics of uh, communities and um, there has been some uh, discussion and debate, and we participated, uh, and that's something new because we generally didn't even uh, went there, you know. Um, and uh, we are seeing some change. Let's see, but uh, and this is really related to the one um, person slash entity one vote because uh, in some cases we see that if the local government want to help or, or join, for instance, a big co-op uh, for a food co-op, 
it can be there, but with uh, one vote, you know? Uh, that could be one option. What do we don't want is just to sell out our community work for that we did uh, over the last uh, uh, years and just give it to some politicians. That, that's something that we try to avoid strongly. But I think that at uh, um, uh, policy level, if you uh, do, I mean, there are tools to, to do the right thing, to uh, in not only you know, involve the, 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 the community, but doing it with, with them. And it's not them, us and them, it's just the same you know, city. Yeah, uh, yeah. We'll, we'll move forward and, and we'll go ahead. Mark, I, I will like, rephrase a bit the question, because you, you are a startup. You're not community-based, you don't have a democratic governance. And also, so uh, maybe I'll rephrase a bit the question. So you can still answer about what, like how you, you plan to, to the governance on how you include community, but I also want to ask you, because you work more specifically with urban planners, and uh, so you, you answered like a request for proposal from city who want to develop new neighborhood to try to integrate urban farms. So how do you ensure that the people who are going to live in this new neighborhood have a say in the production system that you put in place there? Uh, I think that uh, if we want to introduce uh, urban agriculture, we need to create the condition uh, to be the same condition as uh, food uh, we buy today. It seems that when we buy food on the supermarket, it's coming from low-cost country, where the field is, cost is costing nothing, and the labor is low-cost. It seems that if we want to create long-term agriculture in the urban area, we, w we need to create the same condition for long-term business in the agriculture business. For this, I think that um, the promoters, the cities, the majors, need to, let me say, offer the field. On one part of the invest investment, because uh, and we need to stay in the uh, low-tech approach to reduce the cost of investment. But in the same time, we need to have some help jobs to create the condition at the beginning to have a long-term business plan available for create not one shot, one garden uh, or green uh, marketing with urban uh, project, but really uh, new activities with new jobs, with growing. The market is so enormous. And I think that we need to take in consideration that from 10 to 15 calories of petrol are needed for one nutritional calorie today. We have consumed 50% of the petrol in 100 years. It seems that we have 30 years to build our food close to the consumer. Okay. And this is really mm. the motors for moving the agriculture, the urban agriculture. But this is another question, the question of sovereignty is about, like, do the people agree and want your cultivation kit to be the solution to grow food? Like, that's the thing. Uh, no, I, I think that uh, it will be a lot of solution. Mm. Uh, certainly, they will have all certain parameters. They need to be performance, they need to be uh, uh, low-tech or low-cost, that means if we want to introduce them in volumes. Uh, they need to be connected with the city, they can use the water from the roof, they can use all the, um, a lot of the, the heating from the, the building. They, can, uh, they need to be introduced and uh, be connected with the city, with uh, the consumer. They, they need to, to be really a system in the city. They need to take, not as a, let me say, a graph or a thing that we put uh, like a, a roof, but really a system that we need to introduce everywhere. I'd like to go back to the food policy because we had a discussion earlier and it doesn't seem to work so well. So can you tell us, maybe like Malik or Emma, why it's not maybe changing so deeply the food system locally, why it doesn't work so well? So what we've seen in Detroit is the Food Policy Council 
Um, the people most active in it are community activists and maybe small level uh, either merchants or people who work for various agencies, but the big corporate players have not become involved in it. And so they still are dominating the market. And then we've also found in Detroit, and Detroit is a very peculiar circumstance because of the severe economic crisis and because of the fact that for 18 months, Detroit was under what's called an emergency manager, which was imposed on the city by the state. And this individual superseded all of the powers of the elected officials in Detroit. So effectively, democracy was put into a deep, deep coma in Detroit for a year and a half. And so we have a very special circumstance. So in that circumstance, the city uh, elected and appointed officials didn't really see food policy as being a priority. They were trying to figure out how to make the city solvent. And still they're trying to figure out how to make the city just uh, you know, financially uh, uh, viable. And so they're not very concerned about food policy. Now, of course, many of us believe that, uh, that a, lo a vibrant local food system can be an economic driver but I don't think that the majority of the city elected leadership has come to that conclusion yet. So it's, it's still, like, even if we talk a lot about bottom-up approach, it's still very much a top-down decision, no? Emma? I think, I think it's interesting. I think uh, we, we need to think really carefully uh, about some of this as well. And I think, as we mentioned before, politics is really key. When we started out a few years ago on our food journey, food didn't feature anywhere in anything we did. And by having the right conversations, having the right people um, in the room, we started to see little changes, little connectivities of happening. I also think that um, it's important that you try to, and I know we had a conversation earlier, you try to win the hearts and minds of your elected members because they're the ones who can really make a vote or make a change in terms of saying, right, this is strongly, and stand behind you as, you, as you're doing things. So I, I think that's really important. Um, yeah. Yeah. I just want to say that we see politics, sometimes we say politics is the art and science of gaining, maintaining, and using power. And so we don't reduce politics to just electoral politics, right? So politics is also people protesting in the street or people building institutions. And often that kind of power influences the electoral politics. So I just want to broaden the conversation and not just reduce politics to electoral politics. Yeah, I'd just like to add to that. Again, this is where we're starting to see that network of those 13 moving to 50 starting to have a much broader influence, a much broader engagement where we can start to have those, those bigger conversations. And actually, it shouldn't just be the elected members. It should be all those people on the ground who start to make that voice and make that change. Yeah, so finally, it's a question of changing the food culture, as we said, like uh, enabling the emergence of new citizen leadership and the people taking initiative, so switching from a culture of being consumers to being more active, like citizens. Maybe I would like to yeah, give a voice to someone in the public, Sid Sharma. You, can, you have a question, I think. Yeah, hello, everyone. I've got a question. It's sort of, it sort of it follows on from the political uh, element that we're talking about, and it's a lot of the initiatives that we've heard about today are, are political by nature because, you know, to control your own food system is a fingers up to the big business. Um, but also, these initiatives also change culture if they're marketed well to people in that city. So, my question is, with a shift in consumer culture, and remember, everyone has got such power because what they eat three times a day could massively change economy. Um, could you use consumer culture and maybe work in partnership with big business, or is that door firmly closed for maybe Malik and your, your, your entity? Uh, do, would business engage in partnership to make massive change? Because all these are very small things that we're hearing about, and big business controls the majority of the food system. Is there a partnership to be had? So you, you mean like more on, of mass communication, like? Okay, do you want to answer or? So I'll say that our organization uh, doesn't have a lot of faith in transforming corporations. But for those who are doing that work, I, I certainly hope that you're successful in, in doing that. Um, we're more trying to build power on a community level and trying to shift people's consciousness and trying to, in a sense, build an, an alternate system at the same time that we're actively working to dismantle 
the systems of capitalism, white supremacy, and patriarchy. Yeah, there's, there's two things that are coming out of it uh, from what you've just asked. And one of them are, is around visibility um, as the first part of your question. And I think if we can make local food more visible, then it starts to perhaps influence and shape um, buying power. So I'd just like to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've done. We, we did a piece of work in partnership with our university and we looked to map out across our city region and our district, district who all of our local food producers were. And then from that, who were our local food independent restaurants to try and get an understanding of what was going on in the area. In doing so, we had some really interesting conversations and one of them was actually, okay, well, what is local food and where are the parameters and how far does it reach and what do we consider and not consider? But as part of that, we have um, businesses now who are saying, okay, let's, let's shape and change things differently and let's take back control. We have a, a cheese company who wants to work with um, a variety of different areas and the area where I live is very close to the Lake District and they're saying, let's create a Lake District hamper and let's sell it to the big corporations. Let's sell it to, you know, the, the Tesco's are not on the high street so that we're getting our food almost back in their faces. I think also we're trying to do as much as we can to support our local food businesses within the area and maintain and keep our, our independence. And I think that's um, really important as we, as we move forward. And Enrico, you wanted to add something? I just wanted to... Uh, to add that uh, it's uh, at the base of all this, uh, there is a critical consumption. And we need to to foster that, and maybe uh, public uh, strategies, policies can stream on that. Uh, and uh, when you, because I mean, we already are aware of that. I guess uh, in our new vote is when we consume, when we buy from somewhere. There is our vote is not every four years on, on a paper. I mean, I'm not, I mean, democracy is a really good tool, but uh, at all levels, it's not only at um, high level, it's at economical level, it's at community level. So when you buy from you know, a local producer, you must be aware of, of that. And that's the, the, the thing that we are fighting uh, on. I mean, we are activists in, in the sense that we, we um, uh, drive our consum consumption in that direction, but we always, always try to be visible in the neighborhood or in, in, in our area. I, I just want to say that. So as we discussed in lunch, uh, certainly consumer patterns can change corporate uh, behavior. But usually what happens is that the corporations respond to the market demand, and so they may change the products that they're selling, but the motivation is still to make the maximum profit. And so what we've seen in the United States, for example, is the organic food industry is the largest growing segment within the food system. But we still see power concentrated in the hands of a few players, and so that has not shifted. What has shifted, perhaps, is the product line that we're selling, that they're selling. We're much more interested in a fundamental shift in power and who has power. And I'm not sure that just uh, critical consumption is going to fundamentally change that. I'm not sure. I could be wrong. And I just come back to your other point, which was about kind of those global um, and larger businesses. And there's a big debate as to whether we completely ignore them and we say we're going to protect our food culture and this is what we want and we don't want anything to do with you. Um, but there's also a, a flip side of the argument which says, okay, well, let's be clever about this and let's get you to invest in some of our community projects um, and try and support us as we take forward. We've seen um, some uh, investment within our area from uh, one of the larger corporations and it was around kind of not at all the same as the food warriors, which I absolutely adore, but it was around utilizing those skills and teaching people where their food comes from and how it grows. And I think that's something that's really important that throughout all of this conversation, if we're going to change the food system, we need to educate from an early age and we need to protect those skills because quite often we're seeing a lot of those skills 
being lost because people financially can't afford to do it. So I think if the circumstances and the situations are right, then I think that you can uh, definitely... <laughs> Hi. <laughs> I think that you can... Um, Definitely be very clever in how you do it. And even if you uh, fund a project but then weave in the local element into it, I think there's a, there's a way around that. And a lot of the bigger corporations, whilst not out for the same benefits, um, have an obligation, um, you know, social responsibility to support community um, work and intervention. We have only 10 minutes left, so I'd like to ask you if you have some questions for our speakers. Do we have a microphone? Who has a question? Yeah, you have a question, Amanda? How is this power shift going to happen when the corporates are still investing? Because I think the two stories are really contrary, so I'm getting confused. So I don't have the answer. You know, I have some ideas about what might begin to shift power, but clearly I don't have the answer. And if I had it, I would have implemented it already. Um, but I think that the shift in power begins with shifting people's consciousness first. And again, in the case of the community of which I'm a part, which has been historically disempowered, part of what we have to do is, again, take back our own humanity and develop an understanding that we do have agency over our own lives and begin to act in a way that builds the power to control our own destinies. So I know that's one of the steps. Now, what, what the ultimate step is, you know, I don't think we're going to storm the Bastille. You know, I don't think that's the way. Uh, but, you know, I was talking to my brother Brandon earlier about kind of this building of an alternative system at the same time that we're working to, to, um, to dismantle the other system, and then at some point, you know, we reach a, a level where more people are supporting these new, the new vision for a new economy than people who are supporting these antiquated ideas, perhaps. But we have to have lots of critical dialogue because I don't think anybody has the answer to that question, again, or we would have implemented that. Yeah, I'll just jump, jump on your question and, like, don't we need a new, a new narrative? Like, you talk about a switch in consciousness, so... So about cultural shift, about education, but don't we need also a new food narrative? Like the, the main narrative today is about we need cheap food to feed everyone. So don't we need a new narrative? Yeah, absolutely. And I think the new narrative has to start with the understanding that food is a human right. Beyond food being a commodity, food is a basic human right. And so we have to uphold the humanity of everybody on the planet as the number one priority. And profit has to be always second to the best welfare of humanity. You wanted to add something? No? Yeah? Yeah. I'll, uh, I come back and I agree with a lot of your points there. And I think the narrative is so important, particularly at the city level as well, because it makes it much more uh, holistic, much more um, valuable, and much more something that comes from the heart that people can relate to. So in some of the work that we did, it sounds a little crazy, but we uh, did some, had been doing some projects um, in a lot, an allotment, and we had a young girl who'd come down with her family, and um, she was learning new skills and really enjoying it, and it's the first time she'd been and understood where her food came from. That little girl was wearing her football shirt for the local football team, and once we started to tell the story of her family and how she was local, people could see that she came because of the local football strip. They could really then relate to her and really related that this, this young girl needs access to good food. We need to make sure that she is able to, to have food that helps her in a journey of life, but also is healthy, affordable, accessible. And that, to me, was such a switch in people waking up and, and realizing But as we talked a little bit earlier, it's about also framing it so that people understand the story behind food. And, and not everybody, I think, does yet. It's more than, um, you know, what we eat every day. It's about health, communities, resilience, food poverty, all of these really important um, values that need to be considered. I just want to jump on what you said, Malik, because we were supposed to have another speaker here, José Luis Viveropol, who was... Uh, who works on food commons. Unfortunately, his daughter had an accident yesterday. 
But um, he works on the food commons and he says exactly what you say, Malik, that food is a basic human right. And that before, in the time of slavery, people were considered as commu commodities. And we have changed our view on people and, and like being free is now a basic human right. And the culture has also changed on the way we see health and education. So maybe now it's the turn to food. Yeah, so, and uh, this is something that the UN Charter affirms also, that food is the basic human right. So this isn't just something that I'm saying, but this has been affirmed by the international community, and I think we would do ourselves well to uphold that. Do we have another question? Yeah. Uh, you, you, can, you can take my mic. Um, so I'm going to come from a completely different angle. Um, I was wondering uh, if any of you are interested in cooking uh, and if there is a place for, for cooking in, in this whole discussion of food sovereignty that we were discussing. The, the reason I ask is because I come from an organization that are trying to get people to cook for themselves. And, and the reason why we think cooking is so important is because if you look at the, the chain of, from food production to consumption, uh, uh, people can be consuming organic or you know, non-genetically modified food, but if they're not cooking for themselves, you know, they, they don't have real access uh, um, to, to the people who are producing. And if they're only eating mass-produced or prepared food that are you know, prepared by, by the food stalls or food courts, restaurants, that you, you lose that chain. Um, so I was just wondering if any, have, you have anything to say about that. Yeah, um, maybe Sid Sharma will want to answer actually, but yeah, you're, you're the cook here, no? <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll start with you. I mean, I can talk about my experience in Bristol. I live in Bristol, which is a very foodie city. Um, and in England, you can't turn the TV on without seeing a celebrity chef teaching people how to cook. But the irony is that however many programs you have, more people are still buying convenience foods um, and cook and, you know, eating the ready meal from the microwave, watching the chef telling you how to cook. So there's that weird thing. But um, I think cooking is part of food culture. Um, I, I run lots of restaurants uh, and I cook myself and I run big food events and we always have education. We work with um, amazing people that go into schools and teach children how to cook. And so when they come home, you know, there's this thing called sort of like uh, pester power where kids will sort of pester their parents to make the right food choices. Um, so yeah, food, hands-on food cooking is, is probably even more important than, than anything else in, in changing culture. I think it, it's got to be at the top. Emma, you wanted to add something? Yeah, I completely agree with that. I think um, food cooking definitely needs to be considered with this. Um, because, again, it comes back to those skills and that education and people not necessarily knowing how to cook. And particularly in some of our most deprived communities, they're used to having maybe high-fat, high-saturated food, which isn't good for them and then causes knock-on effects into our health system. So cooking is really key and from an early age. I think um, from the introduction of kind of fast food and microwavable food. We have a generation who have lost skills and don't necessarily know how to cook. And I think it's only been recently that we're starting to see some of the knock-on effects of that. So it's, it's absolutely vital. Um, two projects that we do is one around um, going into schools and getting children to engage at an early age in primary schools about where the food comes from, trying to set up a community garden at their school and trying to cook it, eat it, take something home for their parents so their parents can really understand the value that comes from cooking and sharing and eating too. And um, the final point is we uh, have within our area... Um, hostels or family accommodation for homeless individuals and we worked with the council and our homelessness team to um, do a, a cookery project within that hostel so they could use the kitchen and we said it was almost like a meals on wheels so they brought in local food they cooked the meals there fresh and then they delivered those meals to the most um, right most important people, most deprived people, those elderly people who really needed a good, hearty, um, sustainable and healthy meal. A last word, Enrico? Yeah, uh, I just want to say that um, cooking uh, can be a, a really nice uh, kind of project uh, at uh, community level. 
For instance, uh, sometimes we struggle in, during the winter because uh, we don't have the same kind of food. Uh, so seasonal food is also uh, um, an issue, but, I mean, a thing, you know, it's, it's a reality. And uh, dealing with that, uh, um, learning on how to deal with that, is something critical. And in, the, in some food cup, we organize some, how do I cook this during the winter, you know, because there are no tomatoes. So I think we are, all, we are supposed to be done, but can I take a last question quickly? Okay. <laughs> okay, so my, my question is fast. Um, what about the seeds? Um, I know that Monsanto is, is trying to patent and have control over like, most of the seeds that are produced. I was wondering if y'all had any ideas around uh, seed production and seed saving as an aspect of food sovereignty. Yeah, I'll start and just say it's extremely important and we're doing seed saving on our farm on a small level now. We're not saving all the seeds, but we're learning how to do it, how to save the seeds, store them, keep the fertility and plant them the next year. And also I just want to say that we think cooking is very important also and the deliciousness is, is highly underrated. So I think we have to conclude now. So yeah, maybe as a conclusion, we can say that, yes, it's important to try to influence and take part in like broader conversation at the city level and try to make the good connections to influence some, some broader change. But the main impact that we can have is through doing things ourselves in our local communities. This is what, what I really like keep in my, in, my, in my mind after that session. So if you want to um, discuss with the speaker, we are going now to the Maif Terrace. So I invite you all, I mean, not maybe all, but those who want to, uh, to keep the conversation going to join us there. Thank you, and thank you, everyone.